Welcome to video lecture D2. This one is on determinants and row operations. I'm your presence, Tom Roby, and here are the outline and objectives. So our first goal is to explore how row operations affect the determinant of a matrix. We'll see that every elementary row operation has a very simple predictable effect, and we'll use this to compute an example. After that, we'll demonstrate another equivalent condition in the invertible matrix theorem, namely that an n by n matrix is invertible if and only if the determinant of A is not equal to zero. Okay, so here's the first result. So what happens if we, for example, rescale a row of A by K? Then if we rescale a row, we actually rescale the determinant by that same amount. And this is not so hard to see. I mean, let's just say, suppose I've got some matrix, and I'll Instead of writing it with the usual double subscripts, let me write it this way. So I've got A1, A2, A3, and then B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3. This is a little quicker to grasp. Now if I'm interested in the determinant of this, right, well, I know I can expand it, say, around the first row. So suppose I multiply the first row. It doesn't really matter which row I multiply because I just, whatever row it is, I would expand around that row. But so this can be written as um, A1 times some cofactor, the C11 cofactor, plus A2 times the C, I guess that's the 1, 2 cofactor, plus A3 times the C13 cofactor, right? Okay, now suppose I rescale this row by K. So I put a K in front of all of these guys, right? Well, when I do this the expansion around that same row, then I'll just be putting a K in front of each of these guys. All right, so that just factors out, and I get K times the determinant. So that one's pretty easy to see, and it clearly doesn't matter how big the matrix is or how there's nothing about this that depends on how big it is or which row I do it around because I can always expand around that row. Okay, So that one's pretty straightforward. Let's take a look at the interchange operation. So what happens if I interchange two rows? So now instead of having A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3, C1, C2, C3, I have something like, <coughs> so let me compare this to um, versus, suppose I switch the top two rows, B1, B2, B3, uh, A1, A2, A3, C1, C2, C3. So now because I'm keeping track of signs, I need to be a little bit more careful, right? So this guy would be, well, I still want to expand around, around row A so that I get something that looks similar in form to this guy. So if I expand around row A, well, okay, so let's, let's say, see, I've got A1 times, well, now I'm going to have times some sign, which is changed. So I guess I need to also recompute the, the blue one for you. So the blue one here would be, I'm going to think about this now as being A1 times plus 1 times the determinant of B2, B3, C2, C3 plus A2 times minus 1 times the determinant of um, B1, B3, C1, C3 and then minus um, well, I guess I'll put the minuses here, plus A3 times now plus 1 times the determinant of, when I peel those off, B1, B2, C1, C2, right? So now if I swap the order here, but I still expand around this, remember I've got the matrix of signs here, right? So I have plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. And so now what's going to happen is that this A1 will be multiplied by a minus 1 and then times the determinant. When I kill this row in that first column, I still get the determinant B2, B3, C2, C3, right? Which is the same determinant I had before. So now if I add the next term, I'll get um, plus A2. And now the sign here is plus 1. And now be multiplying by the same determinant, B1, B3, C1, C3, and so on. The last term is going to be uh, plus A3 
3 times minus 1 times the same determinant we had before, that guy. Okay? But the main point is that here I had plus minus plus for multiplied times a1, a2, i3. Here I have minus plus minus, right? So this turns out to be just equal to, so this is equal to um, minus the determinant of a1, a2, a3, b1, b2, b3, c1, c2, c3. Okay? Now you could say, okay, well what happens if I say switch the first and third row? Because if I switch the first and third row, then I'll still have a plus minus plus going across the coefficients. But notice that if you do that, right, so now I guess I'll pick a different color here. So now suppose I'm looking at, say, the matrix, you know, C is the matrix, um, C1, C2, C3, B1, B2, B3, A1, A2, A3. I still need to be expanding around this row in order to get something that's similar in form, and I'll have the same signs, but what I'll end up getting is A1 times plus, but now my determinant will be C1, uh, C2, C3, B2, B3. Okay, and then the next one will be um, plus A2 times minus 1 times the determinant of C1, C3, a1, A3 plus A3 times plus 1 times the determinant of C1, C2, B1, B2. And when I've turned these guys upside down by induction, right, this swap interchanged the signs, right? You can just see that this, this term, 2 by 2 determinant, it's easy to check that this is the uh, negative of B2, B3, C2, C3, the one we had up there. Okay? So either way you do this expansion, you're going to get a, a sign flip, but it might appear either in from the matrix of signs when you compute the cofactor or that the determinant has actually changed sign within the cofactor itself. So it's not quite so straightforward, but it's not hard to see. The last one is a little bit hard to see from the little plus thing, so I'm just going to leave it if you're curious to check in the textbook for a proof. But adding a multiple of one row to another leaves the determinant of A unchanged. And this is an extremely useful thing to have up our sleeve because it means that we can do a lot of things to a matrix without changing the determinant. Just like we could do a lot of things to a matrix without changing the solution set, and that allowed us to convert a matrix that was hard to understand to one that was easier to understand, we can do the same thing with if we want to compute a, a determinant of a matrix. Okay? All right, so let's take a look at an example here. If I've got this matrix, then I've got 3, 6, 0, 9, 0, 0, negative 4, 2, and so on. Um, how can I use these properties? Well, the first row looks like I could factor a 3 out, so let's do that. Oops. If I factor the 3 out, then I've got 1, 2, 0, 3, um, but the rest is unchanged. And now I could do several things I could do here, but for later purposes, it's advantageous to interchange rows 2 and 3. If I do that, I introduce a minus sign. So the middle two rows got swapped, and now from here on, I'm mostly just going to use the third property, which allows me to make a bunch of zeros until I get the matrix into a uh, triangular form. So what happens? This, I can use this row to zero out this by adding negative 2 times the first row to the second row, adding the first row to the fourth row. When I do that, I end up with this matrix. Okay, so what do you think I'll do next? Right, so I'll take use this one here to zero out this two. And when I do that, see I'm getting more and more zeros. Again, I'm getting closer and closer to being triangular. So what's next? Um, so there's really two choices. I mean, I could divide a negative 4 out of this row, and then I would get 12 over here. Negative 3 times negative 4 would be 12. And here I'd have like 1 and negative a half. And then I could use that to zero this out. But I actually want to illustrate something. So I'm going to leave that negative 4 here and just say, well, I can add the multiple negative, the multiple of one-fourth times the third row to the fourth row, right? And, and just leave the third row unchanged. And if I do that, I still zero that out. And if I do that, I'm adding, um, I guess, a half, one-fourth of two. Two-fourths is a half to four, and I get four and a half, okay? And so now I'm in great shape because this is a upper triangular matrix. I could just take the product of the diagonal entries to get 
uh, what I want, and I multiply by the negative 3 that I've got from these other operations I did. So the final answer is negative 3 times 1 times 1 times negative 4 times 4 and a half, which is 54. Okay? So that illustrates all of these things. But it's worth pointing out that I actually didn't ever need, I need to do row interchanges sometimes, but I don't actually ever need to factor things out. I could have left this a 3 the whole time if I'd wanted to, and still zeroed these things out by multiplying the top row by, I guess, um, 2 thirds, and then I would have gotten and negative 2 thirds, and adding it, I would have gotten rid of this, multiply it by a third, and add, I would have gotten rid of that. And I could have left the 3 on the diagonal and never had to factor anything out. And that's really what this next theorem says. So suppose that you've got a matrix A that you can row reduce to an upper triangular matrix. And in doing so, you used R row interchanges, because each of those changed the sign, so you need to keep track of them. Um, then the determinant of A is just negative 1 to the R times the product of the diagonal entries of U, right? which is just U11, U22, dot, 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 UNN. Right? So that's more or less what we did in that previous example, except we did a, a little bit more keeping track of. But the point is that you can, you can always row reduce any matrix to upper triangular form just with row replacements and our row interchanges. And so then you won't get, your pivots won't be ones, you won't be able to make it into echelon form, but you don't need echelon form for the purposes of taking the determinant. Okay, so here we go. What's the corollary? The corollary is this thing that is uh, very close to the invertible matrix theorem, namely that a square matrix is invertible if and only if its determinant is non-zero. And the proof is so easy that we should do it. It's a couple of lines. So we know that A is invertible if and only if A has n non-zero pivots. Okay. But it's an n by n matrix, so if it has n non-zero pivots, then it has to have a pivot in every row and every column. They have to be on the diagonal. Okay. And so those means the diagonal entries have to be non-zero. So this is true if and only if every diagonal entry of U is non-zero, but that's true if and only if the product of the entries are non-zero, right? If I want to check whether, and this goes back and forth, right? If, if none of these, if the product is non-zero, then none of these guys could have been zero. And that's it. So in a very easy way, we're able to, once we understand how row reduction works on a matrix, we're able to derive a new simple uh, way of uh, condition for deciding whether a matrix is invertible or not. Okay, and so just to give you one maybe sort of artificial application, because in real life you probably use software to do these things, but you know, if somebody asked you, is this matrix invertible, and you're thinking to yourself, huh, well, I could row reduce it or something like that, but um, one thing that's, or I could notice that somehow the columns are linearly dependent. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different conditions you could do, but one that doesn't require so much cleverness or this, you know, might work well in this case is if I want to find the determinant, how would you compute the determinant of that matrix? Can you see like a way that makes the, the, the computation quite easy? So if you expand along this column, right, then you get a bunch of zeros. And so you only get that this is going to be equal to negative 2 times the 2 by 2 determinant, 3 2, 6, 4, but this is just 12 minus 12, so it's negative 2 times 12 minus 12, which is 0. Okay, so, so it's easy to see that that matrix is not invertible because its determinant is 0. And that's it for video lecture D2. Thank you for your kind attention.